Again, good evening. My name is Will Lavise. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for MCUSA, the Senior Executive for Advancement for Mennonite Mission Network. And I'm honored to moderate this very important webinar concerning the accessibility resolution that will come before the upcoming Special Delegate Assembly in May. First, some details about the webinar procedures. Tonight's gathering is a webinar format, so all attendees will are muted and the chat is disabled. We will, however, be posting links to resources in the chat, including a link to MCUSA's delegate resource page where you can find the proposed resolutions, webinar recordings, links for upcoming events, and other information. We welcome your questions for the writers of the resolution, and we'll try to get as many as we can. Please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. All questions again should be directed at the writers. If you need Spanish interpretation, please click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Again, the accessibility resolution is the focus of this session. Visit the, de the delegate assembly risk or resource portal. And that link is also po uh, posted in the chat for the proposed resolution previous res res uh, webinars and other resources. Review of the procedure for engaging this resolution at the special session of the delegate assembly, as well as the church statement resolution will be discussed. It is important that we listen to one another within the church. Also, it is important that you read the excerpts uh, regarding the uh, summary impact statement on the resolution. Now, before introducing the authors of the resolution, let us bow and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you, we appreciate you, and we honor you for all that you've done for us individually, for all that you've done for the church, Mennonite Church USA. We ask your blessing upon this session and that it may be fruitful and that it may open up eyes and understanding and clarity and that we may all move forward as a church together in peace. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Now, our panel. Our writers of the resolution are Claire Crable and Jean Davis. Claire Crable is COO and Managing Director of MEP. Claire has served as the Executive Director for the Center for Healing and Hope, and most recently comes from Goshen Physicians Goshen Health in Goshen, Indiana. Claire is an active member of the Berkeley Avenue Mennonite Church in Goshen, Indiana, and is a parent of an adult child with Down syndrome. Jean Davies serves as the Executive Director the Anabaptist Disabilities Network, ADN. She has a passion for disability advocacy and inclusion. Jean believes that the whole church benefits when all members of the body of Christ are actively connected. She's an ordained minister and is working on a graduate certificate in disability and ministry at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. Claire, Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you, Will. Um, I am looking forward to our time together this evening. So I just want to thank everyone who is present um, for tuning in and for this opportunity to present about this accessibility resolution. Before I get started, I would like to recognize the many folks who have helped to birth the accessibility resolution and a bit of how we got here. Anabaptist Disability Network or ADN, began work on this resolution in 2014, and it was put aside until 2019, when Eldon Solskus, then executive director of ADN, picked it up again. Many people collaborated to author it, including Tim Burkholder, Christine Guff, Richard Aguirre, Sheila Stouffer Yoder, Jean Davies, Eldon Stoltzfus, Catherine Dixon, Katie Smith, and myself. At the invitation of Anabaptist Disabilities Network, 
four congregations, namely Akron Mennonite Church, 8th Street Mennonite Church, Waterford Mennonite Church, and Berkey Avenue Mennonite Church worked in collaboration with MHS and ADN and endorsed this resolution to bring Mennonite Church to bring to Mennonite Church USA in 2021. So I come to you today wearing many hats beyond that of co-author. First, I am the Chief Operating Officer of MHS, which is an agency of MCUSA. ADN is a member of MHS and MHS is sponsoring this resolution. For those of you who don't know much about MHS, we are a National Member Services Association of 77 health and human service organizations. And as an association, we seek to help our members connect their faith and our work. And our mission is to inspire and strengthen those health and human service ministries to fulfill the, their missions. And for that reason, I am pleased and honored to be representing MHS as we support ADN in fulfilling their mission through this resolution. The next hat I am wearing is that of a member of Berkey Avenue Mennonite Church. I was an elder there when the church made the decision to formally endorse this resolution. I've spent my career supporting the health and the wholeness of the sick and disabled, first as a physical therapist, and then for the past 15 years in leadership at health and human service nonprofits. And lastly, I'm a parent of an adult stepdaughter with Down syndrome. Our daughter, Emily, has been blessed by a loving and welcoming congregation. She has been provided with opportunities to use her gifts for the benefit of the body of Christ, and we are really thankful for that. Even as the church is very welcoming, barriers remain for her and for others with disabilities. While good intentions and good actions exist, there still remains a need for tools and services and knowledge to help support moving those intentions and actions further along. A lot of what has been known to be right and true comes from one set of voices. And our culture is saying we need more inclusion, more of a variety of different voices and experiences to help shape our faith communities. And because of limitations to accessibility in our churches, the voices of the disabled are frequently muted or even absent. The purpose of this resolution is to help all members of MCUSA, including congregations, area conferences, agencies, and constituency groups recognize and seek to remove the barriers to belonging in architecture, communications and attitudes that prevent individuals with disabilities from participating in church life and to bring wholeness to the body of Christ as those barriers are removed and all people are fully integrated into the community of faith. So what is the problem we're trying to fix? Many of you may not know that faith communities in the United States are exempt from mandates in the Americans with Disabilities Act which was passed back in 1990. As a result, many Mennonite congregations lag behind secular organizations, businesses, and public institutions in making the necessary changes to be accessible to and integrate those with disabilities. I suspect that there's agreement among us that the church should be leading in disability inclusion. As the church, we desire to be witnesses to how people should live in right relationship with one another. While celebrating the many steps Mennonites have taken to become more accessible to people with disabilities, architectural barriers persist, hindering the participation of persons with mobility challenges. Communication barriers persist, hindering the participation of those with differing visual, intellectual, or hearing abilities. And attitudinal barriers persist, reflecting a lack of sensitivity, and denying those with differing abilities, dignity and access to spiritual nurture, friendship, freedom, membership, baptism, self-expression, service, and leadership equal to and balanced by the rights of others. We all have the desire, the need even to be seen 
To be invisible or to have our personhood misrepresented is one hallmark of oppression. And as Christians, we all experience the joy and sense of identity that comes from being seen by God. Yet barriers exist that limit our ability to see some members of the body of Christ, including the disabled community. We know that we all lose in this equation. As Mennonites, we seek to support individuals to not only be seen, but also to live into shalom, the very wholeness of God. We seek to support others as they pursue their identity in Christ. But let's be honest, doing so costs us. It takes the willingness to admit our ignorance. It takes an investment in time to listening. It takes struggling through the notion that inclusion means change and sacrifice for ourselves. It will involve awkward moments and it takes time and the willingness to make mistakes, recognize them, try again and make mistakes yet again. And it can take an investment of financial resources. And yet for all it takes, what we stand to gain is beauty and love and wisdom and wholeness it is the very act of reconciliation. So there can be a gap between who we would like to be and who we are as the church as it relates to many groups, including those with disabilities. Lamar Harwick, a pastor who lives with autism at Tri-Cities Church in East Point, Georgia, spoke very directly when he brought home the distance between our ideal and our realized selves in churches in a recent sermon. So these are his words, and in them, I hear a call to action. He said, what COVID-19 has shown us is that the distance COVID has created between us and one another and our ability to have full access to the church is analogous to the distance that has always existed for those with disabilities. It has, in fact, exposed the church's unwillingness, ignorance, and inability to make change happen for the, disability, for the disabled. So here is what I have noticed, he said. When we weren't able to fully access the church due to COVID, didn't the church get creative? Didn't it find money to do things? Didn't it find a way to make sure that those who were not able to access its programs and its worship services had the ability to access it? It showed the disability community what it could have been doing the whole time. So why did we write this resolution? We wrote it as a call to action intended to empower the church toward a vision of providing full access to the disability community for the greater good and wholeness of us all. I will now turn it over to Jean Davies, executive director of ADN, and the driving force behind this resolution to share on the impact of the accessibility re resolution could have on MCUSA. Thanks, Claire. The approval of this resolution would raise awareness of barriers to belonging for people with disabilities. And with that increased awareness, congregations and larger church bodies would commit to making the necessary changes to make sure that people with disabilities are fully included in church life. Changes that make the church more accessible can be simple. They can be as simple as serving gluten-free communion bread to allow people with celiac disease to participate. Or they can be as complex as making the effort and taking the time to discern and employ the gifts of people who are disabled, including gifts for leadership. Changes can be inexpensive, such as offering digital worship resources for people who are visually impaired. Or they can be expensive investments, such as installing an elevator or renovating restrooms. Whether they are simple or complex, inexpensive or expensive, changes are needed so that all are welcome and everybody belongs. We may not all be able to do everything, but we can all start somewhere. 
Anabaptist Disabilities Network would support congregations and larger church bodies to access, assess their own accessibility and make the necessary changes for greater inclusion. We would do this in collaboration with Mennonite Church USA agencies and related organizations that serve people with disabilities. Some of the ways that ADN would support the work of disability inclusion are by providing assessment tools, such as access accessibility surveys, so that congregations can evaluate their own accessibility. Offering events and resources for all ages to raise awareness and change attitudes about disability. Sharing and developing resources, including curriculum for people with disabilities. Providing resources to congregations through congregational disability advocates and consulting with congregations about addressing specific barriers. Congregations could then take action by assessing their own accessibility through an audit or inventory, or by periodically surveying their congregants to learn of any barriers to full community participation. Congregations could develop a plan to increase accessibility in some way. For example, motorized door openers or wheelchair ramps, assisted listening devices for people who are hearing impaired, digital worship materials for people with low vision, or Sunday school classes that raise awareness and increase understanding. Calling a disability advocate or an advocacy team charged with helping to assess accessibility, identify and remove barriers, share resources on disability, and call forth the gifts of people with disabilities in the congregation. Also congregations can call out and employ leadership gifts of people with disabilities. The last question that was asked was, how does the proposed resolution enable us to join in God's activities in the world? God has called us to a ministry of reconciliation. Unfortunately, many people who are disabled and their families have felt excluded. This resolution will call us to the work of reconciliation of healing the harm that has been done and restoring loving relationship. God calls us to be the body of Christ in the world. To do that, we need to include all Christians and we need to employ all the gifts. God has a different value system. It's not all about efficiency, and expediency. Jesus saw the important gifts of people who were on the margins. We are called to notice and value everyone. We are called to listen carefully to everyone and be led by people who have experienced life differently. In this way, we will build up the body so that we might more fully reflect Christ in the world. Accessibility is not just for the benefit of disabled people. If we don't include everyone, then we are not whole. So accessibility and disability inclusion is not only our responsibility, but our joy. We need to have all people present 
with gifts fully employed in order for the body of Christ to be complete. Then the church can be an example to the world of people living in right relationship, loving and honoring one another as children of God. We have some panelists who will be speaking about their experience with disability and the church, telling stories and speaking about the importance of this resolution. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Will Leviste and he will introduce them. Thank you, Jean. And also thank you, Claire, for that very detailed and, and heartfelt uh, description of the uh, accessibility resolution. And with that, I will begin to introduce our other uh, panelists. First being Bryce Miller. Bryce Miller has served as a pastor for more than 16 years with congregations in the US and Canada, enjoying creating opportunities for hospitality and service. He presently serves Menno Mennonite Church in Richville, Washington as a co-pastor with his wife, Emily Towles, and their children, Luke and Anna. And I will turn it over to Bryce and we will introduce the other panelists as well. And then at the end, we will have a Q&A session. Take it away, Bryce. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining around this resolution and speaking with it and around it. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, to speak across the country. We don't often talk about church leadership as a matter of risk, but it always involves risk. As much as it's a calling of the spirit, a preparation of the individual, a discernment of the community. It's also the simple willingness of the person to simply to, to say yes to the call that involves, at least on some level or another, a good deal of risk. There is risk, as we all know, the demands of the job impacting personal and family health. There is the risk that despite everyone's best intentions, those who are called to serve can end up being wounded and injured along the way. There's a risk simply in raising your hand and saying, yes, I am willing to lead, all the while wondering if there is a community that is willing to have you. This is true for all leaders and all people who say yes. But it's even more true for leaders for whom accessibility is a challenge. I'll really say that I did not set out to be a pastor. I spent most of my college summers serving as a counselor at a summer camp, building skills, incidentally, that I now know to be pastoral. But I never really imagined them, imagined them to translate here or in this way. Even when my shoulder was indeed tapped and the door was opened in such a way that I had almost no choice but to walk through, I spent most of my seminary career proclaiming that a master of divinity did not automatically mean that I was going to be a pastor. I had my experiences. I had my practical education along the way and it planted the seed. 
but it took me almost a year of personal discernment following my education and my graduation to take the step to open myself to a pastoral call. For me, it was not so much that I thought that the mechanisms of church were automatically or definitively shut to me. It was more the simple fact. I remain convinced that were I to take the risk to step forward and to be sent, that more likely, more than likely, I'd be met by a polite but profound silence. As someone for whom speech does not always follow easily or clearly, a basic requirement of pastoral work, I was not sure if it could work out on a practical level or how people might feel about receiving the body of Christ from a shaking hand. The work that I had to do was to establish in my own head that the risk of rejection was one worth taking. The possibility of no loomed large with me especially when the first conversation that I had with the congregation ended up in my declining their offer because the particulars of the fit did not work out very well. Like men of Simons, who on discerning the call to leadership was known to pray, let the call burn within me so I can do no other. I was left with a conviction that would not leave me alone, even though it was one that I myself doubted more often than not. In the end, it's a risk that I'm glad that I took and one that I will never regret. But it's also as a sense of doubt that I sometimes still carry. To be clear, in my case, the accommodations and adaptations to make leadership work for me were not a matter of construction or of massive change to make it possible. And perhaps it would have looked differently if it had been that level of need. Rather, it was a matter of signaling that the call that I had heard within me was one that the broader church was willing to entertain and willing to welcome. This is something that are saying together that we want to welcome all people in all levels and all abilities to our life together does in an important and effective way. That's why this is important. It's not to say that we as MCUSA will suddenly or automatically become perfect in our expressions of access. Rather, it is to say together that this is where we wish to go, even if we may not entirely know how to get there. I count myself fortunate that I did find a place and a way to serve and now struggle to know myself doing anything but this. I know of others who have not had the same experience as I have. Persons of gifting and of talent that I grieve have not been able to realize their call that they hold in their lives. 
Opening the doors allows us to broaden our expressions of what does a pastoral leader look like, sound like, act like, feel like, and ultimately to expand our ways of modeling to ourselves what does Jesus look like and sound like and move like and feel like all at the same time. This is all of our work as one that benefits us each one as we follow the wounded and risen Savior. I'm grateful that we are considering this resolution together and that we can hear stories together even in the very opening and initial seeds of it. May we each take the risk of saying yes to the calls that we have in our own lives, even when that risk puts us at challenge. Thank you, Bryce. And thank you for having the courage to take the risk. Next, we have Joni Miller, who is not unique in her experience of finding herself the parent of a person with disabilities. Like many, she felt unprepared, fully unprepared, in fact. She spent much of the last 30 years learning to understand the world within the context of this role to the point of graduate study focused on how to learn as adults. She lives in Kelowna, Iowa, and is the mother of three, grandmother to three, and wife to Carrie. She currently serves as Director of Training and Resources for Mennonite Mission Network and attends East Union Mennonite Church. Joni. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you for allowing me to share tonight, everyone. So accessibility can be um, seen from a really practical standpoint, like getting someone who uses a wheelchair into our church building in a welcoming and safe way, for example. But my sharing tonight is from a slightly different standpoint. It's one that's a bit more focused on the underlying need that drives us towards this type of action. My first daughter had unidentifiable, unidentifiable damage to her brain, either right before, during, or soon after her birth. And suddenly, my world was appointments, speech therapists, neurologists, psychologists. I had to learn words like static encephalopathy, grand mal seizures, pervasive developmental disorders, speech disorders, sensory perception disorder, behavior plans, assistive technology, EEGs and MRIs, mental retardation. No way, that's the wrong word now. Use intellectual disability, institutionalization or community placement. Do we join the ARC? Do we join NAMI? Trips to Mayo, the University of Iowa and NYU, finding out all about the ADA and IDEA and writing an IEP and realizing civil rights were not just about people of color, but about my daughter and our family's needs. Now, if you're beginning to feel lost and you just want me to stop talking because you don't understand what I'm talking about, you are just where I wanted you to be. It's where I found myself as a new parent. And it was confusing, hard, difficult, painful, and it was lonely. It was not what I thought parenting was to be, and it was not who I thought I was going to be as a parent. And for me, under all of that were these deep, deep questions around why. Was it my fault? I had chosen to go through with a high-risk pregnancy. So when my daughter was born, the hospital called her the miracle baby. So beautifully perfect. So why would God provide this miracle and bring it to this? How could we begin to understand his purpose for her and his purpose for us in our role as her parents? 
at one point we were attending a very small Lutheran church and our daughter was loud. She couldn't speak words, so she screamed. She could not sit still. All those diagnoses I mentioned before, well, they lived out in her small body very loudly and very disruptively, but it was never talked about openly. It caused us great discomfort. Were they watching us and assuming we were just bad parents? We asked the church if we could talk about it. We went to the pastor and asked. We said we needed to feel the community understood what we were living. How could you call an ambulance on Saturday night to give your daughter Valium as they rush her to the hospital to stop a seizure that could end her life and then go to church and worship on Sunday morning? We needed to be known and for her to be known. We asked twice for that conversation. It never went beyond the asking. We left that church despite loving so much about it. Our task of finding a new space to worship focused on things like, are the pews padded? Is the floor carpeted? Are there easy exits and quiet spaces to go to? Years later, I talked honestly with one of the members of that first church, and I told her my version of this story. She responded that she thinks no one thought it was a problem that our daughter was so disruptive. She said, they just accepted her. I want you to know that silence does not translate into acceptance. Silence is isolating and it is disrespectful and it separates. I urge you in this time to not allow your assumptions to drive your judgments to not make decisions for others or make decisions about them without including them in that decision-making. I want you to know that true accessibility starts with community and being known as a value part of that community. Thank you. And thank you, Joni, for sharing your, your miracle with us. Next, we have Peter Graber, who is a retired communications and fundraising professional living in Elkhart, Indiana, with his wife, Mary. Their daughter, Emily, 38, lives with multiple disabilities. They are members of Sunnyside Mennonite Church in Elkhart. Peter is the president of the Anabaptist Disabilities Network Board of Directors. Peter Graber. Good evening. Uh, I'm glad that I was invited to do this, a chance to tell our story. Also reconnect with some people that uh, I used to work with at Mennonite Mission Network. Our family has been on uh, this journey of ours for about 38 years now. Our oldest daughter, Emily, was born in Indianapolis with microcephaly, cerebral palsy, a seizure disorder, and some GI conditions. During early infancy, Emily looked and acted pretty much like other babies, even though we were noticing some troubling signs at home. As an adult, Emily is nonverbal and uses a wheelchair, but she loves to be with people. Interacting with her is rewarding, but it takes some time and patience. By the time we moved to Bell Fountain, Ohio and began attending Bethel Mennonite Church in West Liberty, Emily was one and a half years old and her delays were more obvious. The pastors and church leaders made a concerted effort to welcome us, including Emily. As she got older, they set up a special assistant for the Christian Education Hour and someone to sit with Emily during worship so that we would have a break and be able to attend more to the service and to our other two children. Emily enjoyed the special attention and we enjoyed the relief. It was a good thing to do. The pastors and church leaders were also helpful in asking us what we needed and then helped us recruit and train several families who would take Emily for a day or a weekend so that we could have a break. This was a wonderful response from the congregation, but it didn't eliminate some painful moments. 
As we picked up Emily from one of the weekend caregiving families, their comment to us was, you probably don't understand how much work this is to care for Emily for a whole weekend. I, we did understand. <laughs> So the formal response of the church was very good, but some individuals still had trouble fully accepting and understanding us. It's hard to live into somebody else's shoes and understand what that's like. We were rarely hosted by others in their homes and Emily was never invited to a birthday party by one of her age group peers. As Emily grew, it became more and more difficult to get her up the stairs at Bethel. We, along with some others, began advocating for an elevator and accessible restroom. This met significant resistance, but with some education and advocacy, the elevator was built and Emily joined a group of older members who used it every Sunday and many times in between. When we moved to Elkhart, Indiana, we attended Rose Lawn Mennonite Church, now True Vine Tabernacle. This is a bilingual and multicultural congregation, and we wanted this experience for our family. It was a smaller congregation and had fewer resources, so we didn't feel like we could expect the same kind of services we'd been receiving at Bethel, and we were right. However, maybe because most of the congregation had personal experiences of not fitting in, the personal engagement with Emily was very positive. After a few years, Roseland built an addition to the foyer that included accessible restrooms on the ground level, and that was a big help. But the sanctuary, fellowship, and education areas remained inaccessible. So after about 10 years at Roselawn, our family began attending Sunnyside Mennonite Church at the south end of Elkhart. And part of the reason we chose this congregation was its full accessibility for mobility impaired people. Emily was now pretty much full-time in a wheelchair and difficult to carry up and down steps. Sunnyside had an accessible family restroom, so when I was caring for Emily, she didn't have to use the men's room. There's also accessible parking and a no-step entrance. Sunnyside also provided a person to accompany Emily during the education hour, and she really appreciated that one-on-one -on -one time with this group of volunteers. After a few years, we were approached by the pastor and asked about baptism for Emily, who was now almost 30 years old. Our family discussed this and decided that Emily did not understand enough to make an informed commitment. We did ask the church whether there was a way to welcome her into the fellowship, and then we were blown away with the service that they came up with. The people who knew her best all gave testimonies about their experiences with Emily. She was brought on the stage. It wasn't ramped right then, but it is now and she answered some questions using a communication board and the congregation stood to affirm her. There was singing and there was sprinkling of water on the congregation via pine branches drip, dipped in water and then flung from the aisles across everyone. After church, there was an outdoor party with many of Emily's favorite foods and activities. It was a great day for Emily and our family. So what do I think of the proposed resolution? Uh, it's not going to be a panacea. It won't make a lot of difference for families like us with long established relationships and sort of carved out our place in the church. It would have been good to have when we were younger so the congregations might have approached us rather than we approaching them with certain questions. We chose to attend congregations that welcomed us and asked us the important questions. How can we include you better and what can we do to support your family? With the resolution, we hope that more congregations will equip themselves to invite everyone to belong fully in the fellowship and that people with disabilities and their families will not need to choose the one congregation that is accessible because there will be many to choose from. I don't see this resolution as a change in our beliefs as, dom as a denomination. Rather, it's a statement about who we are and who we want to be with a set of best practices to help us make progress on that journey. Thanks for the chance to share. Hope to talk with many of you in the future. Thank you, Peter. Uh, especially thank you for showing, sharing how a welcoming congregation can make a very important impact on a, on a family. Thank you for that. Next and last for our 
but not least, of course, in our panelists will be Derek Raymer, who has been pastoring for 19 years and is the pastor of New Creation Fellowship Church in Newton, Kansas. Derek is a husband and father and loves to ride his bike. Turn over to Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, yeah, I love riding my bike, whether it is um, my bicycle or my motorcycle. I will take either one on a beautiful day. So uh, as Will said, my name is Derek Raymer, and I am the pastor at New Creation Fellowship Church in Newton, Kansas. And I just wanted to share with you a story um, of, of a moment at New Re Creation uh, where we excelled at being the kingdom of God. I only preach 50% of the time at New Creation. The other 50% is predominantly covered by others within our church. We have placed a high value on hearing multiple voices and know that we get a fuller, more complete image of who God is because of that. We have an individual in our congregation, and we will call her Melissa. Melissa is an adult with a developmental disability. Uh, I would say Melissa in uh, most ways operates on a third or fourth grade level. Uh, and we have found ways to keep Melissa involved in the life of our congregation. And Melissa has found ways to stay involved in the life of our congregation. There are people who connect with Melissa weekly, even if it's just by a phone call. Uh, Melissa will often give me a call and, and is often happy to talk to me. Melissa is in a rotation of those who regularly read scripture for us in worship. And we have an open mic sharing time each Sunday. And uh, she more often than not will share during our sharing time. Sometimes Melissa gets a little lost in her sharing. Um, and she can be difficult to understand for those who are not used to listening to her. Uh, but I have never once in my six years at New Creation experienced the congregation to be uh, impatient or annoyed with her during those times. I'm grateful for Melissa and for her involvement at New Creation. And I was comfortable with the ways that we had sought to include her wasn't really looking to uh, find other ways. At a worship serving unit meeting, as we were discussing uh, shoulders to tap for the sermon time, somebody in our group suggested asking Melissa. I was hesitant. Uh, the question that I asked um, was if we were going to ask Melissa, how could we do it in such a way that um, she could be successful uh, in, in taking the sermon time? And it was suggested that maybe we could use a sermon time to interview her. So I approached Melissa and she was very excited to do the preaching time and immediately said yes. So I met with Melissa individually to run through uh, some questions with her and figure out how we wanted this morning to go. And when it came time for the Sunday morning, we sat on the stage together in chairs and I interviewed Melissa. Our service that morning was amazing. And I'm not uh, proud of my hesitancy or reluctance for asking Melissa to do this, but she was amazing. We all got to know Melissa better as we heard about her journey in life and her understanding and relationship with God. We made more space for Melissa. And because of that, we made more space for the Spirit. And the Spirit showed up in a powerful way. One of the unexpected gifts for us that morning uh, with Melissa was that she ended up being the first in a series of interviews that we now do. We interview people in the congregation on a Sunday morning now four to five times a year uh, as a way to get to know one another better. And Melissa helped to open that door for us, 
for how we continue to walk together at New Creation. Now, before I say we did just a wonderful job with that, I also uh, feel like I need to tell you that our elevator at church, our old, outdated, and obsolete elevator is broke. And it has taken us far too long to uh, begin to raise the monies to make that fix. So like many congregations, uh, I think there are things we have done well and things that we need to work at um, and, and ways that hopefully we can be more faithful to who we believe Jesus is calling us to be. I believe it is important as a church to seek out how the spirit is moving. When we encourage participation from all members of our communities, we see a fuller image of God and the spirit moves more freely in our midst. Thanks. Wow, thank you, uh, Derek. I mean, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm thinking about how you are transparent about being hesitant and teaching us that it's, it's okay to be hesitant because actually that a lot of times that is when the spirit moves in us as we trust. So it, in that hesitancy, you taught us something about trust and looking at the things that it opened up. So I, I thank you for that. And thank all of the storytellers for their sharing. Um, one of the things that occurred to me is that I think all of us, if we don't have a direct relationship with someone that may be a disabled we have some kind of indirect or removed one or two people removed. And I, as I was listening to the storytellers, I was thinking about one of my own nieces, Naomi, who's uh, the daughter of my, um, one of my, my second brother, Thomas, who was developmentally de delayed. And we were just talking about her the other day, uh, just yesterday, Tom and I was, was talking about her and how every time Naomi see me, she just lights up. And I light up, you know, because of course I'm a, her favorite uncle. But it's just, it's a, it's a blessing because you just see her joy in a way that she's able to light up a room. Uh, and that's a lot of what the gifts are and the blessings that come with, you know, a relationship, a loving relationship like this. And so at this time, I'd like to transition to our Q&A section. We've asked you to post questions if you have uh, for the uh, resolution writers and I'll toss one out to them that has been uh, pre-submitted. Uh, talk some, Claire or Jean, uh, talk some about what are the implications of the resolution for, you know, for a conference or a congregation? Elaborate more on that. I know in your, your introductions, you talked some about that, but remind us so about that. Um, so you're asking for uh, how that would impact congregations uh, and conferences. Is that correct? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. So uh, really, it would be just it would be congregations and uh, larger church bodies, conferences, um, and the denomination committing to greater accessibility, to examining themselves and saying, and you know, sometimes. It's not a question of accommodating the person who is there. It's who's not there, and and why aren't they there, right? Um, uh, I recently was talking with someone different, different uh, denomination, but um, who was really happy to be a delegate in their denomination. Um, they'd never been able to do that before because it wasn't virtual, and they could never fully figure out accessibility to be able to participate. And they wanted to be a delegate for decades and we're not able to do that. And we're finally uh, able to do that. Um, so for congregations, I think uh, accessibility might seem a little scary. Oh, we're gonna have to spend a lot of money to renovate our building. We have an old building. Uh, maybe that's true, maybe it's not true, but there are all kinds of ways to become more accessible. Um, to people with disabilities, and we don't have to do everything at once. Um, as I said, there are sm small changes that we can make, 
There are changes that we can just make in attitudes by learning more, for instance, about mental illness or learning more about autism, um, uh, learning more about, you know, things in your building. How high are your signs, right? Are, this, are all the signs in your building up here, you know, so a wheelchair user can't read them? Uh, so there are simple changes and inexpensive changes as well as larger projects when people are, congregations are willing to take those on. Did that answer your question? Claire, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I think Jean did a wonderful job. I think the only thing that I would add to that, um, and many of our storytellers brought this up as well, is to simply ask ask the people who are in your church, what do they need to more fully engage um, and, and hear what they have to say. And um, also just to reiterate the point that Jean made of who is not there. Um, I know um, when I was younger, um, I was in a church in a different town and they had a program there that provided one-on-one -on -one, um, um, attention to anybody with a disability, youth with a disability. And we had a huge number of kids come to that church with disabilities and provided a really exciting ministry to them. Um, so it was very much of a, we built it and they came um, situation. And it was a wonderful learning um, and a wonderful experience for everybody who participated. Claire, for you, as you were going through the process of drafting the uh, content for the resolution. What was, you know, informative, enlightening, you know, for you as you, as you all were drafting? Yeah, so first I should say that when I came into the process in 2019, we were working with a draft that was already, already there. Um, so, um, I, you know, I was already aware, having, having started my career as a physical therapist, that people with disabilities um, um, were not, the, the ADA, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, was not um, something that churches needed to do. Um, and, um, and so that, that, that was a pretty big need um, to be able to get this, this information out to people. Um, you know, beyond that, I think it was really trying to come up with the wording um, that brought it beyond just accessibility towards a vision for vibrancy and wholeness. How about you, Jean? It was sort of enlightening and for you as you were drafting. So I just wanted to say, I'm gonna go back to your previous question and say, um, the impact that it'll have on the church is not only that they will be working to be more accessible for people with disabilities, but also they will benefit from including the gifts of people with disabilities. I think that's something that we want to emphasize that the body of Christ is complete when we have all the gifts employed, right? And that Jesus, the, the gifts that Jesus values, right? We need to really carefully discern those, right? We need to be listening and taking the time because, um, you know, they can come in a variety of ways through a variety of different kinds of people. Um, and I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, tell me again the second question. Oh, you're muted. What was informative for you as you were drafting? I mean, you, you have a personal experience as you shared, but as you began to draft it, what were some things that were lightning? Maybe a ha ha moment. No, well, I've been uh, studying disability and ministry for quite a while. I'm going to complete a graduate certificate in disability and ministry. So it was, I just enjoyed putting it together with all of the people. It really was a team effort um, to do that. Um, Eldon Stoltz was, uh, picked that up. He's the um, former director of Anabaptist Disabilities Network, and then I, I carried on that work. So again, I came as Claire did later on in the process um, of kind of refining, refining that statement. What opportunities or challenges do you anticipate for res uh, resolutions implementation if it, uh, if it passes? 
Jane. Um, yeah, tremendous opportunity. I mean, I um, that is my life is disability, uh, working with people with disabilities and disability inclusion. And um, I used to pastor a church that was for uh, people who were intellectually disabled and their families, people for whom uh, a typical worship service uh, doesn't doesn't really work for their families. And uh, what a huge blessing that was. So um, I think that the more people that we include, uh, the more blessings abound. So um, the challenges, the challenges for um, the resolution or challenges to accepting the resolution? Challenges if it passes. What, what oh, challenges, challenges if it passes. Well, we have to take a good hard look at ourselves, right? Um, and that's not always easy um, uh, to have some humility and try to figure out um, what we could do better, right? It requires repentance, requires some, uh, some transformation. It's, it can be difficult work. It can be painful work, actually. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't take it up. And you, Claire, uh, opportunities and challenges if it passes your thoughts. Yeah, for me, the a really big opportunity that I am hoping that people will engage in is doing the accessibility assessment. Um, you know, all that costs is your time of sitting down and looking and seeking out what opportunities um, you can identify within your own congregation of. Um, of ways to create more accessibility. I, I don't think any of us get up in the morning and say, gee, I wanna create barriers to the disabled, right? Um, but we don't, we, don't, we, we don't know how to take those down. Um, and what I'm excited about with this resolution is it gives tools um, to be able to um, start moving forward and change. Um, and that to cast a vision for yourself as a church, as an organization, and as individuals um, to seek to provide more holistic relationship with all people um, is exciting and life-giving work. Um, and you know, we can move into that and make mistakes as we go along, um, but it's still exciting and life-giving work. Uh, I think that the challenges are what Jean said. It's, um, it's the challenge when we work with anybody who is different than us. It's to, and it's to be willing to enter into a little bit of discomfort um, of the unknown and to admit that we don't know um, and to come into relationship with grace, um, but also some hope. Excellent. Well, there are no additional uh, questions in the chat. And so with that, I'll thank all of the panelists for your participation and your sharing. I want to remind all the attendees to register for our next webinar, which will be expectations for the special session of the delegate assembly. It'll be on April 5th, 7 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Also encourage you all to go to uh, MCUSA website and sign up for peace mail. The link will be there in the chat. That's our weekly news e-newsletter that informs you of all of the things that are happening most recently in the denomination. And you can also, of course, go to the website as we shared earlier, get information about the upcoming uh, delegate assembly. And again, I, I thank you all for your participation, for your ear, for your attentiveness. And um, my technical crew tells me that we do have the song I am here, written by Anne Hamlin. And so we will bid you farewell and good night. Please stay on and listen. It's about six minutes long, I understand. And so again, a beautiful song, but again, thank you and good night. I see the people walk by me as my one-on-one -on -one checks on me. Talk, laugh, and yell. Some ignore everyone else, too. I wonder if they even know I'm here. I am here. Some of them stare at me like I'm putting on a show. I am not sure that my strange.
themselves to my staff Telling her how sweet and dedicated she must be To work with me It's me and I am here I am here The handsome young man comes over To flirt with my one-on-one -on -one. She enjoys this attention as she smiles and giggles they both seem to forget I am here 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 and I may not be like you but still I'm here I am here you be aware of me now that is okay because eventually you will know I am here I am here I am here what they don't know is that I hear and see everything I am aware of all that goes on and I smile myself and I'm happy to say I am here I am here I am here I am here I am so happy to be here weird mannerisms and all and it's a joy to be here even if they do here. 